These are the frugal living hacks that I use to save us thousands as a family and help us to live below our means. First of all, give up something or downsize. In this cost of living crisis, if you are on a tight budget and fighting against the tide of rising prices, then something has got to give. Either you need to find a way to bring in extra income, which if you're like me, are a parent, it is incredibly hard to find any extra time in order to bring in that extra income, or you need to tighten up on your spending. It's likely to be much easier to control your spending than it is to dramatically increase your income very quickly. For me this year, the thing that I have given up is getting haircuts and getting my hair coloured at the salon. So, so far that has saved me £200 and I think by the end of the year it's going to have saved me well over £700. And I already cut my children's hair, have been doing that for a couple of years, I think that saved me well over £150. What you choose to sacrifice will be very personal to you and when I say sacrifice I don't necessarily mean that you have to give something up altogether. Obviously I've given up going to a salon but I'm still coloring my hair at home. I've just found a cheaper way to do it. For example, if you really love going and getting your nails done, are there some tutorials online that you can watch so that you can improve your own skills and do it yourself at home? Next tip is the dollar per use rule. This tip has really helped me to curb unnecessary spending on things that I don't really need and also to seek better value for money. All it means is that whenever you are thinking about buying something, think about how many times you will use it in order to work out the cost per use. Say I buy a dress for $50, I'm only gonna wear it once, That's $50 per use but say I buy a pair of jeans for $50 that I know that I will wear at least once a week for an entire year that's less than a dollar per use really strive for a low cost per use with everything you buy and also use it as a reality check to stop you from spending money on something that realistically you know you're only going to use or wear once Switch to reusable period products. I've got a menstrual cup here. They last for around about 10 years and they cost between 10 and 20 pounds. It might take you a few goes to find one that you actually like. But after a few months, you'll break even with the money that you save on buying disposable period products. Not only are you sending less rubbish to landfill, but you're also gonna be saving money over the long term and they are super easy to use once you get used to them. If you really don't like the idea of a menstrual cup, then why not switch to period underwear? You can now get some really, really cheaply at the supermarkets. And once again, as with this, over time, you will make savings because you won't be having to regularly buy the disposable products. Most period underwear will last for around about 100 washes, so a few years, and you can buy them at different levels of absorbency. If you've identified something that you need, wherever you can, do your best to get it free or get it cheap. I have found some amazing community groups on Facebook for my local area where people are just giving stuff away that they don't want anymore, just on the proviso that you get in your car and go and pick it up. Now, now obviously with larger pieces of furniture, you may have to absorb the cost of having to hire a van or maybe you have a friend who can help you out with getting it to your actual house. But once it's there, if you needed a brand new sofa or some brand new outdoor furniture, you're gonna have saved hundreds of pounds because you haven't bought new. You can also try to get things for free or a really cut price with food as well. Either try shopping at your supermarket at the time when you know that most of the yellow sticker foods are out. By yellow sticker foods, I mean the foods that the supermarkets have discounted because they're about to go out of date. You could always ask someone in your local branch, like what kind of time do you put the yellow stickers on food? Is it in the morning or is it afternoon? and then you can try and time your shop so that you're more likely to grab those yellow sticker discounted bargains. And there's also apps that are aimed at combating food waste that will give you either free food, such as the Olio app, which connects you with people in your local area that have got food that may go to waste, so they're offering it to you to come and take it off their hands, or you can try the Too Good To Go app, which I love. This has got massive restaurant, cafe, and takeaway brands signed up to it. And at the end of any sort of day, they will have bags of food that is about to go off. And so they will sell those bags of food at cut price. The biggest downside with this is that you don't know what you're gonna get. It's called a magic bag because it is a bag of totally random food. If you're a fussy eater, it's probably not gonna be for you. However, if you can make a plan to use it or you can make a plan to freeze it, then it's a really, really good way to get cheap food. Another option if you've grown tired of the stuff that you have in your house is to try and transform it yourself. Upcycling furniture is something that's actually not too difficult to do and there's tons of tutorials for it online, on YouTube. 
I did it with this sideboard. I got really, really fed up of it. It was just like this really dull kind of yellowy wood. So I painted it, I painted the drawers, I put on new drawer handles and I'm so pleased with how it ended up. And it's meant that we're now several years down the line and we've still got it. We didn't get rid of it and buy something else to replace it. My next tip is to face head on your nice to have spending. If you feel that you're not saving as much as you'd like to, or you're going very, very close to the top of your budget every single month, then it can really help to face the reality of how much you're actually spending on stuff that you don't really need. Gym membership, subscriptions, all that stuff. Now, the Telegraph newspaper actually has a calculator on their website that makes it really, really easy to do this. They've just got some sliders on there and you can just show it how much you're spending per month on each of these categories. And it will show you the reality of how much altogether you are spending on nice to haves every single month and that can just be the reality check that you need to either give certain things up or have your takeaways a little bit less or downshift to a cheaper brand or a cheaper gym whatever it is it could just give you that motivation to make a positive change so that you're saving a bit more money boring dinners Boring dinners are not a bad thing. It is great to find a new recipe, but I often find when we find a new recipe and we think, oh, that looks really exciting, we end up buying all of these ingredients and it adds up to like 25 pounds or more to buy all these jars of herbs, spices and sauces that we need, plus the meat, plus anything else. So embrace having boring dinners. It is okay to have like scrambled eggs on toast for dinner or a soup for dinner that you've made out of leftover vegetables from the fridge. My next tip is to make your own cookbook. I read an interview with a recipe ghostwriter the other day and it just totally blew my mind. Obviously I knew that big chefs use recipe ghostwriters because they don't necessarily have time to like churn out a hundred recipes when they've got a ton of other stuff going on. But what really surprised me was that this recipe ghostwriter revealed the amount of copying that goes on between cookbooks. They basically said like, for example, once you have the perfect scone recipe, like, you know why tamper with a good thing it's a great scone recipe you can tweak it little bits here there and everywhere but at the end of the day if you found the perfect scone recipe that's the perfect scone recipe so this get recipe ghostwriter was saying that as long as you change a recipe by 20 percent it's cool to just basically cut and paste it into a new cookbook so 20 percent might include like fiddling around with the levels of ingredients or adding a dash of something different in there so what that means is that you've got a lot of recipes that are effectively being copied between cookbooks and it just made me think like god we, i've probably got tons of cookbooks on my shelf with very very similar recipes between them like not money well spent plus there's so many free recipes online now so what i do these days if i find a recipe that i really like i save it to my favorites on instagram or on tiktok and then i'll go back and i'll either longhand write out the recipe as it's been given in the video or i will do a screenshot of the actual caption and then i will print that off and i will just stick it in a folder and that way you can create your own cookbook of your favorite recipes that you found online and you can organize it however you want as well so you can organize it by cuisine or by whether it's a weekday meal or a Friday night treat. Use AI to help you reduce food waste. I have saved a lot of money on food by reducing the amount that we waste. I try to challenge myself to use up what is in the cupboard, what is in the fridge before I even think about going out and doing another weekly shop. If you've got loads of random ingredients and you just have no idea how to bring them together in order to make an actual meal that your family will like to eat, then you can use ChatGPT, give it the list of ingredients that you've got and it will suggest recipes for you. Make simple changes to save on your energy bills. You can shave a decent amount off of your annual energy bills just by making small changes that you won't even really notice the difference with. Make sure that you're washing clothes on cooler washes, so keep it at 30 degrees. Try turning your thermostat down a degree in the winter. Don't leave the heating on overnight. Instead, wrap up with extra blankets and extra layers when you're in bed. Switch to LED bulbs, which will consume less electricity. And don't tumble dry your clothes. Try air drying them, particularly in the summer when you've got good whether they actually dry really, really quickly out on the line, or you could use a heated area. Now, a heated area does cost money in electricity, but they, generally speaking, will cost much less to run per hour than a tumble dryer well. So it will ultimately cost you less to run a heated area than it will to dry your clothes in a tumble dryer. My next tip is to split the cost of streaming services. You can use more than one device at a time to watch certain streaming services. Some services have cracked down on you sharing your password with people that don't live in your household. For example, 
Apple, Netflix and Disney Plus have got really, really strict on this. I think there are ways around it though. So for example, Netflix will allow you to add on a person who doesn't live in your household. So say you have an older child who's now living at university or they've moved out and they're living independently. You can pay, I think it's something like $4.99 a month to add them to your account. And that is cheaper than them having to take out a whole standard account of their own. And then you can split the cost. And there are other subscription services like Paramount Plus that haven't cracked down on that password sharing just yet. Do not pay for insurance monthly. You will pay extra for things like house and car insurance if you pay monthly. So try and set aside some money every single month so that when the annual renewal comes up you can pay it off all in a lump sum and ultimately you'll end up spending less. Find the cheapest place for fuel in your area. You can use websites and apps in order to seek out the cheapest fueling stations in your area. So just make sure that every week or every fortnight, however often it is that you need to fill up, that you're making a plan for how you will get there, just in case it's a little bit out of your way. And while we're on the subject, you should always be seeking out the best price for the stuff that you have to buy regularly. If you're not sure that your supermarket is working out to be like the best value for you and the stuff that you buy regularly, you can use the trolley.co.uk UK website in order to compare prices of products between supermarkets. It just gives you a really good idea of whether or not you're getting the best value for money from the place where you're shopping. Embrace sustainable living. There is a huge overlap between frugal living and sustainable living. It's all about wasting less and making the best use out of what you have. And that means that you're not spending as much money on buying new stuff. Some things that you can do include learning how to repair your own clothes, swapping to more sustainable products, for example, ditching paper kitchen towels and getting some extra cloth ones and using those instead. Always bring your own snacks wherever you go, try cycling or walking instead of driving, go to your local library instead of buying brand new books, always use a reusable shopping bag, use reusable face wipes instead of disposable ones, and really really importantly look after your stuff. I have saved so much money on kids clothes from being able to pass down from my eldest daughter to my youngest daughter, things like school shoes and seasonal clothes. Put your money somewhere smart. We've talked a lot about frugal spending habits so far, but it's also really important to apply frugality to your savings. You wanna get the best possible value for your savings, i.e. put it in the place where it's gonna work hardest for you and you're gonna get the most interest. Now, where your savings would be best for you really depends on a huge range of factors such as your age and how much money you've actually got in savings, how much longer you plan to work for, when you wanna retire, how much you've got in a pension. There's a whole bunch of stuff going on, but just to let you know, from my perspective, what I try to do to be sensible with my money, I try to max out the interest-free options for my savings. So that means using an ISA and also premium bonds as well. I have some easy access savings money because certain savings I need to get access to regularly and I don't wanna have to pay any penalties for having taken that money out early. So I have a small bit of easy access savings. And then I also have investments. Really important to me that I make use out of investments because I can see that over the longer term, this should hopefully give me a far better rate of return. Historically, investing has given a far better rate of return compared to just putting it in a bog standard bank account savings account. Keeping your savings somewhere like a virtual jar on a money saving app or just in your current account means that you are gradually losing value on the money. Like you're not gonna be making a competitive rate of interest on it and as inflation pushes prices up, the value of what your money is worth is eroded. So take a step back and just consider not only how much you can afford to save every month, but also the bigger picture. Like where do you want to be in 10 years and where could you be in 10 years if you committed to saving a certain amount and how will different savings options benefit you over the course of that 10 years? I hope you found these frugal hacks useful. If you've got any of your own, please leave them in the comments below and don't forget to hit like and subscribe for lots more money saving tips from me.